from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. My message is going to be brief and my text is going to be Luke, the 23rd chapter, beginning at verse 42. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The greatest and most historical event of all of history was when Jesus Christ died on that cross. And when Christ died on the cross, the lightning flashed, the thunder roared, the darkness came as the nails had gone into the hands of Christ and a spear had gone into his side and the nails through his feet. And Jesus was hanging between heaven and earth, suffering for us. The soldiers had taken him out of his prison and they'd put a crimson robe on him. They'd beaten him two or three times. And then they took two or three murderers with him, two of them in particular who were going to be crucified with him. And then they took him across Jerusalem he belongs as much to the African as he does to the European and as much to the European as he does to the Asian. Jesus Christ belongs to all people, but an African helped him carry his cross. And then when they got to Golgotha, these soldiers went about their work, nailing the nails in, these two murderers and thieves that were being crucified with Jesus were yelling, screaming, crying. But Jesus never uttered a word. And they took some medicated wine that acted as a sedative and gave it to the two thieves and they took it and they offered it to Jesus and he refused it because he wanted to drink the very bitter dregs of death in our place for us. He wanted to suffer all of death, showing that God loved the world and God was willing to forgive the sins of the world because of what Christ was doing on that cross. The people that were watching were laughing and sneering. They said, he saved others. Why can't he save himself? Come on, you worked great miracles. Why don't you work one more? You raised Lazarus from the dead. You raised a widow's son from the dead. Why can't you save yourself? Those blind people did not realize that God had foreordained and predetermined that Jesus Christ was to die the death of the cross. And it was only through that death that the world could find forgiveness and salvation. There is no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. The Apostle Paul was an intellectual, one of the most brilliant men that ever lived. And Paul went to Corinth, pagan, intellectual, immoral Corinth, the university center of the ancient world. And Paul said, I'm determined to know nothing among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why did Paul say that? He said that because God has locked up in the cross the secret of the universe. The only way that earth can ever find reconciliation with heaven is by way of the cross. The only way that you can ever get to heaven is by way of the cross. And if Jesus Christ had not gone to the cross, you could have never had sin forgiven. You could have never gone to heaven and the problems of earth would have never had a solution. Only by the way of the cross can we find our way back to God. And that's why it was important that Jesus stay on the cross. Because you see, man is in rebellion against God. Adam and Eve rebelled in the Garden of Eden. And every man since Adam and Eve has broken God's law and sinned against God. 
And as a result of that, God and man are separated. And man's only way back to God is through Jesus Christ. Man had broken the law. Man deserved death. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. But God said, wait a minute. I'll give my son. I'll let him die. I'll let him take the judgment and the hell for you. And if you will put your trust and your faith in my son, I will forgive your sin. I will change your life. I will give you an inner peace and joy and satisfaction that you would never find in any other way. So Jesus was dying on that cross for your sins and your sins. Some people say, why don't you try to make your gospel relevant? The most relevant message in the world tonight is the fact that Christ died for you. He died in your place. He shed his blood for you. And without that experience, no one can get to heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ died and the people laughed and sneered. And two people that sneered and laughed the most were these two thieves and murderers that were dying with him. They were both mocking him, but one of them became strangely silent. And finally, this one that was silent turned and rebuked the other thief in the air of the murderer and said, we're dying justly. We deserve to be crucified, but not this man in the middle. He's a good man. He's the son of God. Then he turned to him and asked him what seemed to be an improbable, an impossible question. He said, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Will you remember me, Lord? And then Jesus gave one of the most astounding answers in the history of the world. The angels in heaven must have been shaken and startled and amazed when they heard what Jesus answered. Jesus said, today, today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. Think of it. Here was a thief a murderer, a man that had committed every crime in the books, dying, turns to Jesus in his dying moment and says, Lord, remember me. He didn't even say, forgive me. He didn't even say, Lord, take me to heaven with you. He didn't say, Lord, prefer me. He just said, Lord, remember me. And Jesus answered quick as a flash and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And to all of you people that think you can't be converted in a moment and that you cannot be saved at this hour and at this moment in this rain in Baton Rouge and have your whole life transformed, you read the stories of the New Testament and the encounters that people had with Jesus. There are many of you that came here tonight in this rain that never dreamed that you were going to meet Jesus. You came out of curiosity or you came because your bus was already on the way or you had already promised some friends to come or you're a student here at the university and you came out of curiosity. Many of the people of the New Testament that came to Jesus never planned it. They never thought that they would have their lives changed. This thief on the cross that had been in prison, knew that he was going to die on a cross, he knew he deserved it. He never dreamed that before the night came, that day, he would be in heaven. He deserved judgment. He deserved hell. I'm going to see that man in heaven someday by the grace of God. He wasn't saved by his good work. He didn't even have time to be baptized. He didn't have time for anything. But he's in heaven. That's the grace and the mercy of God. And I want to tell you that the greatest word in all the language of men is forgiveness. 
That day, Jesus forgave him of every sin he had ever committed, wiped the slate clean, and he was in heaven. There are three things about this passage. The whole gospel is in it. There's repentance. It's the only deathbed repentance in the whole Bible. I don't know what led this fellow to ask that question or to make that statement. It might have been the prayer that Jesus had just prayed, Father, forgive them, they know not what they do. It might have been what Jesus had said to John concerning his mother. I don't know what it is or what it was, but the Holy Spirit used it. The Holy Spirit used it to convict him and to convince him that he needed Jesus and he repented of his sins at that moment and he was saved. I can imagine the other thief saying, why, what have you done? Have you turned preacher or something? You remember we strangled that old merchant for his gold? Remember you kidnapped that little child? Remember that girl you raped? Remember that person you slew? You think God's going to forgive you? Are you turn a preacher? He can't forgive you. I don't care what your sin is. I don't care how deep in sin you've gone. I don't care what you've done. God can forgive you. God can cleanse you. God can make you a new person tonight if you put your faith and your trust in him. Yes, he repented. And the second thing he did was to believe. The Bible says if we believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. The scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Just repent and believe, and then you'll be saved. He said, when thou comest into thy kingdom, as though he were thinking of some far off kingdom age somewhere. And Jesus answered and said, today, right now, you'll be saved. Right now, you can have eternal life. You can put your trust and your confidence in Christ now. And he did. And that day, he went to paradise. Now, it's the word remember that I want you to think about a moment. He said, Lord, remember me. Did you know that God forgets? Did you know that there's a scripture in Jeremiah 31, 34 that says, I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more? God can forget. God can forget your sins. What does God forget? God never forgets the universe. He sends the rain. Yes, sir. God sends the rain. But the rain falls on the just and the unjust. The sun comes upon the just and the unjust. God blesses all of us with all of his blessings. He never forgets. Suppose he forgot the sun rain. Suppose the sun ceased to shine. The earth would turn into a glacier. Suppose God would forget because the scripture says that God holds the whole universe together and if God ever took his hand off, it would blow to pieces. And then the scripture says that God remembers you. Tonight, I had in my little office here where I see people, a lady and her children and a mother and their son and their husband is a prisoner in North Vietnam. I don't think any of us will ever know what these families have suffered. I don't think any of us will ever know what those boys out there have probably gone through psychologically and physically, never knowing. And then we had another one come and see us tonight and her husband, she's just found out, is, a, is alive and a prisoner, but for a long time she didn't know. He was only missing an action. But let me tell you this, God remembers them. And when we bowed our heads in the little office and prayed that God would remember them and that his grace and his love would reach out to North Vietnam to the prison camp and touch them. God remembers them and God answers prayer. How many times has God been with you? You don't even know. 
because you see, you almost had a wreck the other day. But you were saved from it. Why? When you get to heaven, you may find out why. It might have been divine intervention. And that happens to all of us. God remembers you. And then God never forgets our sins either. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. The Bible says, God is not mocked for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. The Bible says, for God shall bring every work into judgment. God is going to judge every sin that's ever been committed. What is your sin that so easily besets you? It's going to be brought to light, all the secret things. God is going to judge it. God never forgets sin. No sin has ever been forgotten by God. God has recorded everything you've ever done and all the things you've ever thought from the time you were born till the time you died. It's all there. It's all in the record books and God will never forget. Nothing is going to be forgotten. How do you stand before God? But there's one thing God can forget. He can forget sin because of Christ. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, He hath made Him to be sin for us. It says in Isaiah 53, The Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of us all. It says in 1 Peter 2, 24, Who His own self bear our sins in His own body on the tree. The Scripture teaches that God can forget our sins because of Christ. The sin that would damn us, the sin that would send us to judgment, the sin that would send us to hell, God can forget. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says your sins are purged. In Isaiah 43, it says your sins are blotted out. In Psalm 103, it says your sins are put away. Isaiah 38 says your sins are put behind his back. And in Hebrews, it says God can remember your sin no more. Ladies and gentlemen, because Christ died, because he rose again, because of what he did, God cannot remember my sin. I've committed plenty of sin in my life. And even if I'd only committed one sin in my whole life, it's enough to cause me to go to the judgment and be lost because I could keep the whole law and yet offend in one point and I'd be guilty of all. But God has forgotten my sin. He forgot every sin that I have ever committed. Everyone he has forgotten. He's the only person in the whole universe that can forget. He has the ability to forget. Has he forgotten your sin? Have you brought your sin and laid it at the feet of Jesus? What a night to give your life to Christ. You may never have another moment like this. The Bible says, He that hardeneth his heart, being often reproved, shall suddenly be cut off, and that without remedy. You've sat here for over two hours in the rain. Many of you are soaked all the way through. And you've done it because you want your sins forgiven, many of you, and others of you have sat here because you're praying for somebody that needs Christ. And this is your hour and your moment, and it may never come again like this. I'm going to ask you to do something that I saw people in London do. I saw people in San Diego do. I saw people in Pittsburgh do. I'm going to ask scores of you to get up out of your seat right now come across this field in the rain and stand here and by coming say I want Christ in my life I want my sin forgiven I want to know I'm going to heaven I want to know that I will not be at the judgment in that final day I want my life transformed by the power of Christ I'm going to ask you to come right now men women young people God has spoken to you you need Christ and in a moment like this you'll never forget it I met a missionary out in the Far East a few months ago. Said, I received Christ one of those nights at Wembley Stadium in the pouring rain in England and stood ankle deep in mud to find Christ. 
and said, I thank God because if it hadn't been for the rain, I don't know whether I would have come that night or not. But he said there was something about the challenge of coming forward in the rain that challenged me and it changed my life. Yes, it's not easy to come, but Christ went to the cross for you. And many people are on the way now. You get up and come and make your commitment to Christ. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. to all of you that have come. You've come tonight to make your commitment to Christ because you want your sins forgiven. You want to know you're going to heaven. You want a new direction in your life. And you've come to make a commitment to Christ because you want him to forget your sin and save your soul. Well, I want to tell you, he remembers you and he loves you and he wants to forgive you. He loves you. Keep that in mind now that God loves you and is willing to forgive and forget all the past. And from tonight on, there are four things that are very important. First, read your Bible every day. We're going to give you a Gospel of John. We want you to read it several times before you read any other part of the Bible. We're going to give you a Bible study. We're going to give you some verses of Scripture to learn, memorize. This helps you to grow. Desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, the scripture says. You cannot grow in the Christian life without reading and studying the scriptures every day. Secondly, pray. God will hear and answer your prayer. You're his child now. He loves you. Take every detail to God in prayer. He will answer your prayer. Don't let a day go by but what you spend a few minutes every morning, every evening, and all during the day in prayer and pray about everything whatever the details are nothing is too small to bring to god's attention and then thirdly witness for christ how do you witness you witness by the smile on your face you witness by the new attitude you have in the dormitory the new attitude you have toward work the new attitude you have in the home and then you witness by going to somebody of another race and going out of your way to be kind and courteous and gracious. And people will soon say, well, what's happened to you, Mary? And you can say, well, I've found Christ. He's changed my life. That's witnessing. And then fourthly, get into a church where Christ is preached and get to work for Christ. Get into the church and work in the church. You say, but I don't like to go to church. Jesus went to the churches of his day and they weren't all they were supposed to be but he did it to set us an example that we should go to church. Four things, read the Bible, pray, witness, and go to church. Now I'm going to ask that we bow our heads and I want you to pray this prayer out loud after me. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to turn from my sin. I receive Christ as Savior. I confess him as Lord. From this moment on, I want to follow him and serve him in the fellowship of his church. In Christ's name, amen. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. 
or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. It's Anne. She's in trouble. And if you don't take it to the edge every chance you get, you're dead already, baby. I was in trouble, and I didn't know what to do. Where are the Jews? I knew that I could take on the world. It's like you're in a dream, but not really a dream, this is reality. I don't really believe in all this, but I know something crazy is happening right now. Tonight, I'm glad to tell you as we close that the Lord Jesus Christ can be received. Your sins forgiven. The Billy Graham. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. I found a friend when life seemed not worth living. I found a friend so tender and forgiving. I can't conceive how such a thing could be that Jesus cared. No fear, my worldly cares are few. I found a friend, he can be your friend too. I found a friend, he can be your friend too. so true would give it all for you I found a friend and life began anew I'm sure you will find that he'll be your friend friend we have in Him. Now tonight I want you to turn with me to the 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. The 15th chapter of Luke's Gospel. And here is where Jesus is telling a story. He tells three stories. He always used stories to illustrate spiritual truth. They're called parables. And everybody likes a good story. And Jesus was accused by the Pharisees and Sadducees and some of the religious leaders of fellowshipping and talking to sinners. And they didn't think you should. And so he told this story. He told about a, a son that wanted to get his inheritance and leave home. And it's well known around the world as the prodigal son. It's a picture of a young man, maybe out on a farm. He has a brother, an older brother, 
And he goes to his father, and it was the law of the land, and it was the law of the day, that he could ask for his inheritance. And being the youngest son, he inherited one-third of the estate. And his father was a wealthy man. And the father tried to talk him out of it. He said, Dad, I'm tired of being here on the farm. I'm tired of being under your authority. I'm going to go to the big city, and I'm going to live it up. So he decided that he would go to New York, or he would go to some great city. And uh, he took his money. And when he got there, he found some people that were very happy to be his friends because he had money to throw around and money to spend on them. And he took them to the best plays, and he took them to the best restaurants and the best nightclubs. And he had a marvelous time for a short time. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. Then it comes to an end. You can have a good time in sex, in getting drunk, I'm told. And I see it on television. They seem to be having a good time, but there comes an end to it. There's an emptiness to it. It leaves a void and you never get enough. And he was very much like young people in our modern generation. They don't want to be told what to do. And that's what young people are saying. Some young people are saying to their parents and teachers and the local police. Some of them are saying, have sex now. Don't wait for marriage. Buy now on credit. Pay later if you can. Assert your independence. Assert your dependence. Do your own thing regardless of the consequences. The Atlanta-based Center for Disease Control says that the number of American girls who are sexually active by the time they're out of high school has jumped from 28% in 1970 to 51% last year. It's currently estimated that one in 500 adults in the world are now infected with AIDS. And it's going to be an epidemic that some people feel could destroy the human race unless we find an answer to it and find it soon. This young man in Jesus' story sets out. He's going to live that kind of life. He wants all that he can get out of life, the good times. Out of sight of anyone who might know and criticize him, free to do as he pleases. There are over a million runaways in the United States every year. I realize many left home because of abuse and so forth. A recent article told of a boy who turned to life on the street when he was 12. And he said, I was a kid in trouble. I was in trouble with the law, with drugs, with alcohol, with my mom, with school. I was both drug addict and drug dealer. I was a criminal and a victim. I was an abuser and abused. And how many of our young people have gone to the streets and left home? Street life is a dangerous business, let me tell you. One out of every three runaways is lured into prostitution within 48 hours of leaving home. With the threat of AIDS, prostitution is a slow form of suicide. Almost all street drug users share needles. In their hunger for a fix, most ignore the precautions against AIDS. Street kids die quickly and quietly, we are told in our magazines. In America, more than 5,000 teenagers a year are buried in unmarked graves. Did you know that? 5,000 teenagers a year are buried in unmarked graves. Teenagers are not, only the, are not the only runaways in our society. Hundreds of thousands of men and women run away from each other and their marriages through divorce. One person speaking of an affluent community in Southern California said, everyone here is running from something and this is the last stop. There isn't anywhere to go from here. I saw a book with a, little, with a title the other day in the bookshop, Help Lord, My Whole Life Hurts. And how many hurting people there are here tonight. This prodigal son is a picture of all of us because all of us in a way are running from something. Some of us have to depend on some sort of sedative just to get through the day or some sort of jolt, some aid. 
to get through the day or through the night. We've aimed for our personal happiness and missed the mark of God's plan for our lives. Jesus said, you serve me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Many of you go to church. Most of you, I'd say, have been baptized or you have gone through confirmation. But deep inside, there's a void, there's an emptiness, and you are not certain that if you died at this moment, you'd go to heaven. You are not sure that you're ready to meet God. You're not sure that you know Christ. You're running. All, us around, all around us here tonight, those of you that are listening outside, running away from something. This boy squandered his wealth and wild living. He spent it all and had nothing to show for it. In Isaiah, the 55th chapter, it says, Why spend money for what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen to me and eat what is good and your soul will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Hear me that your soul may live. When John F. Kennedy was on his way to that place in Dallas to give his last speech the day he was assassinated, he had in his speech this passage from Mark, the eighth chapter. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? In other words, you could have the whole world. It's not worth if you had it all, which you can't get. If you had it all, it's not worth as much as the soul that lives inside your body. You see, you have a body, but living inside is your soul or your spirit, that part of you that can have fellowship with Almighty God. And that's the part of you that's lost. And that's the part of you that needs renewal or dedication or redemption. And then this young man got to the city and had his wild fling. Then a depression came. It wasn't a recession, it was a depression. And let me tell you, I lived through the depression of the 30s and there's a great difference between a depression and a recession. What we're going through now would have been considered a great affluent depression compared to what the people of the 30s lived through in this country. And a depression could come again, we don't know. The picture of this young man's recognition of his condition Jesus said he began to be in need. The first thing that happened was he lost his money. He couldn't get a job. He lost his friends. They were fair weather friends. And he didn't know what to do. Jesus says he began to be in need. He was hungry. And so he finally got a job feeding some hogs. And uh, you see him in that hog pen. Here he was, the son of a wealthy man. Out of his own lust and his own greed, he had wandered away from home. And now he has a job feeding pigs. But he, while there in that condition, he learned what the real life is all about. He was very humble. He became sorry. He said, I will arise and go to my father. My father has servants that have far more than I have. I'll go back to my father and I won't be his son anymore. I'll say, Father, when I get there, I'll become a servant if you'll only take me back. He said, I will arise and go to my father. Father, I have sinned against heaven. Notice he said against heaven. And in thy sight and am no more worthy to be thy son. Here you don't find any trace of arrogance, not trying to justify what he'd done. He realized he had sinned and he cast himself on the mercy of his father. In King David's great confession of sin in Psalm the 51st chapter, 51st Psalm, he says, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. Because in this passage, Jesus is teaching us, God is the Father, he, lo he loves us, he longs for us to return, he longs for us to come back home, he wants to give you guidance in your life, he wants to give you a peace and joy and assurance that if you died you'd go to heaven. 
But first, there must be a change. You must turn around. That's called repentance in the Bible. Repent, the scripture says. And so it says, in, and he arose and came to his father. He arose. He had to leave the pig pen. And that's why we give an invitation at all of our crusades. We give people an opportunity to take that step of repentance toward God. Many of you need to take that step tonight. Well, when you get back home, what kind of reception are you going to get? He didn't know. So he staggered in his dirty, filthy, smelly clothes back toward the home that he'd left. And the scripture says, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. God's not waiting to judge you. God's not waiting to condemn you. God loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you, to shed his blood for you. He wants to put his arms around you and receive you back to himself. You've wandered away from him. And he will take you and forgive you and love you and be your friend. God is a God of love and mercy. Oh yes, there's coming a judgment. There'll be some day when you will stand before God at the great judgment day and you'll have to give an account of your life here and you'll have to give an account of what you did with Jesus Christ on this very night. Because there's going to be a judgment but God's judgment is also tempered by his love and his mercy. He's willing to forgive you tonight. He's willing to give you a chance tonight. Today is the day of grace and salvation for all who will come. Not because we deserve it, but because what Christ has done for us on the cross. By the cross and the resurrection, God has provided a way for you to have peace and joy and happiness in your heart. And as you're growing up, you need guidance. You need direction. Not to just wander about, but some destination, something to guide you. God will guide you. In Romans, the sixth chapter it says, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. In 1 Peter, it says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Now he didn't come like some young person would probably come back and say, hi dad, how are you? Did you miss me? Can I have my old room back? No, he didn't come with that attitude. He came in true repentance. True repentance doesn't presume on the grace and mercy of God. Can only come when the Holy Spirit convicts you and draws you to God. Beware of the attitude that says, I know that I'm on the wrong road, but I'm not tired of it yet. I'll repent and come back to God somewhere down the line. You may not be able to repent because the further you travel on the road away from God, the harder your heart gets. And the less you think you've done anything wrong and the less you think you need to repent, you must make that choice tonight. And the scripture teaches to come while you're young. Some of you think that you're too bad to come to God, have done too many things and gone too far. If you feel a tug in your heart to make your commitment tonight, you come because that's the work of the Holy Spirit working on you right now. I don't believe anybody is here tonight by accident. I think you're here because God saw to it that through a series of circumstances, you're here on this very night. The Holy Spirit is at work urging you to come. Don't harden your heart. The Bible says, he that hardeneth his heart being often reproved shall suddenly be cut off and that without remedy. Now is the time to come. Now is the time to receive. Jesus told the story of this man, this young man, because the religious leaders had accused him of associating with bad people. 
Jesus told them there's great rejoicing in heaven over one person that repents. One person making his commitment tonight will cause rejoicing in heaven. You need to come home to God tonight. When that young man came, his father grabbed him in his arms, kissed him, ordered his servants to prepare a banquet for him, ordered that the finest robe in the house was put on him and a gold ring put on his fingers to signify that he had been received as his son again. He didn't take him back as a servant. He took him as a son. And that's what God will do tonight from you. Our, we just, our last crusade before this was in Glasgow, Scotland. And here's a letter from Scotland that I want you to hear. This is from a girl. I think she's about 19. No, 18. Before you came to Glasgow, I was an 18-year-old with a very big chip on my shoulder. I thought God owed me so much. I thought no one loved me. I thought there was no meaning to life. Something was missing in my life. I thought I was having a lot of fun. I was going out with the guys and getting drunk. I hated my family and felt so unloved. To be honest, I still feel unloved. Even by my family, they think I'm just a loser. One of my brothers used to sexually abuse me. The other one beat me up. I feel like I have it rough with very little love in my life before this week. I'm no angel. In fact, I'm a totally awful person. A few months ago, I was expelled from school and I was blaming drugs. My parents are still mad at me. My dad is a doctor and my mother is a teacher. They say it looks bad on them having a daughter like me. I don't fit in with my family. I heard you were coming to Glasgow and I said I would not go. But where I work, I was told I was assigned to do first aid every night at the crusade. And I was not happy. I went on Tuesday and I mocked you. I laughed at you. I said, what does he know anyway? I said, doesn't he know God does not care for us? But I guess I was listening anyway. On Wednesday, I said, I don't deserve God's love. I never cared if anyone saw me or what anyone thought. I felt loved for the first time. And on Thursday night, I came forward and received Christ as my Savior. I want to know this God who loved me more than anything. I feel loved as I write this letter. I have been received home. That could happen to you tonight. We receive hundreds of letters like that every week as young and old alike come to Christ. How many divorced people meet at a crusade like this? They come to the crusade, they receive Christ, and they decide to remarry. And that happens time after time after time. You say, well, Billy, what in the world do I have to do? First, repent of sin. That word repent means you change your way of living and tell God that you're sorry for what you've done and you come in humility. And then the second thing is by faith you receive him. You say, Lord, I receive you tonight. I talked to a man today. He said, I, I go to church once in a while. He said, uh, I burn a few candles once in a while. And he said, I think that maybe indicates I'm a good man. I said, you have to go further than that. You have to receive Christ into your heart and your life and make him first in every decision you make. From now on, Christ is your leader and guide and savior. He died on the cross and shed his blood to forgive all of your sins. He rose again, he's alive. He's coming back again and someday he's going to set up his kingdom on this earth. And we're all looking forward to that day and you can be in that kingdom beginning tonight. You don't have to wait till he comes back. You can come tonight.
and be sure. And there are many of you here tonight that are just not certain of that. And you'd like to make sure. And you want to surrender your heart and your life to Christ. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat from all over the stadium and come and stand in front of the platform and say, by coming, I receive Christ into my heart. You say, well, why do you ask people to come forward like this? Because every person that Jesus called, he called publicly. Did you know that? Everyone was public. There's something about making a public declaration that settles it and seals it. And you're saying to God and the whole universe, I take my stand for Christ. I receive him as my savior and my Lord, and I'm going to follow him. And if you have been in the church, but have wandered away from the church and wandered away from God, come back to him tonight. He stands with open arms, ready to receive you with love and mercy and grace. You get up and come right now, hundreds of you, and say tonight, I'm watching by television, and you're not sure that Christ lives in your heart. You're not sure that he's your Lord and your master and the director of your life. You can make your commitment where you are. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll-free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching. Let fear, for our God is a consuming fire. And this passage says that when the world is shaking and trembling like an earthquake and things are falling all around, there'll be certain things that will remain. And I want to talk about those things that will remain. We're living in a changing world. On a world scale, we're seeing gigantic geophysical and ecological calamities throughout the world. And then we look at our world and we see the changes that are taking place in Europe. We see the wars that are going on in former Yugoslavia. And there are many people that think that perhaps we're seeing the beginning of what could be another world war in that part of the world. There are changes in weather patterns, an increasing number of tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, natural disasters. What's happening reminds me of a bishop who made an amazing speech in a church 125 years ago. He was speaking at a conference, and the bishop said, the millennium is at hand. Man has invented everything that can be invented. He's done all that he can do. And the words were spoken by a man by the name of Wright. The presiding officer challenged the remark, suggesting that a great invention would come along in which man would be able to fly. And the bishop said, no, he'll never fly. God won't let him fly. That's made for the birds or angels. You know what his name? His name was Wright, and he had two sons by the name of Oliver and Wilbur. And they invented the airplane. And they flew it first in North Carolina <laughs> at Kitty Hawk and it changed human history. And yet there are certain things that have not changed in all these changes that we see taking place. We see things that are changing and things that are not changing. And the big question yesterday is, in our lives among young people especially, is what is meaning? 50 years ago, the philosophical question was, what's the truth? Today's question is, what is the point? 
Albert Camus said a quarter of a century ago, man cannot live without meaning. And before we came to the platform, we were sitting in there talking into another room, and we were talking about the purpose and meaning of life for young people today. And so many young people are searching for purpose and meaning. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is life all about? And the suicide rate throughout the country continues to increase among young people. They can't figure life out. T.S. Eliot once said, where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? The Bible says the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we hear a lot about the internet and the information highway. And we're seeing some things in it that disturb us. Because on the internet, they can put pornography. The information highway is carrying all kinds of things that we don't like that could destroy our way of life someday in the future. It's a wonderful thing. All of these things, atomic power is wonderful. But man, for some reason, uses it for destruction. The word crisis is an overworked word. But this is a period of political change. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Those are the words of Jesus. That word distress means to be pressed from all sides. And I think we feel that way today, that we're pressed from all sides. And the more automation we have and the more science gives us, the less time we have. The more instruments we have to save time, the less time we have. And the word perplexed means no way out. This is a period of social change too. The greatest problems facing mankind today are social injustice, which is worldwide. It's not just limited to the United States. It's worldwide. It's within the human heart, and the human heart has to be changed. That's the answer to our problem. That's the answer to our race problem, is the heart needs to be changed. But there's the poverty problems. My goodness, the people that in parts of the world that are refugees, that are starving. You see it on television and it breaks your heart. And if you love the Lord at all, it brings tears to your eyes to see the suffering that people are going through. And we need to do what we can. We can't do it all. It seems that the whole world expects America to do it all. We can't. We might as well tell them we can't. We can't solve all the problems. Only God can do that. Then we see nations of the world arming, many with atomic weapons, many with chemical weapons, biological weapons. They can turn loose some bugs and disease could sweep the planet. The uncertain economic problems with huge debts. Not only America is in debt, many countries of the world are in debt and many families are in debt. How are we going to pay ourselves out of it? There's the drug and the alcohol use that we think is going to solve our problems. And then as a result of the wrong use of sex, we have AIDS. And there's no cure for AIDS. We're spending millions of dollars every year to try to find an answer and we haven't found it yet. Every little bit, somebody comes up and says, we think we've found something that's going to help, but it turns out to be a false alarm, a false hope. And then there's loneliness. People are lonely today, but some things never change. The laws of nature don't change. There are certain truths that never change. God hasn't changed. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change. God hasn't changed in all of these centuries. The Bible says that God had no beginning. He has no end. I don't understand that. Who made God? Where did God come from? I don't know. 
He's always been. He's always existed. He's the same in every generation. And he doesn't change in the slightest. It says there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning with God in James. He's the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. And the scripture says in Revelation 4, Holy, holy, Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Three times he said, holy. That stands for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God does not change. And he hasn't changed in all the centuries. God is unchanging in judgment. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, the Bible says. He's going to judge every one of us. There's going to be a great judgment day in which we will stand before God. And we will have to give an account of the life we've lived and the things we've done and all the secret things that we've done will all be pulled out in front of the whole universe to see. And God is a holy God who is going to judge. But God is also unchanging in his love. God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. And when we finish this crusade, I hope there'll be one thing that stands out in your mind, that God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves me. The Bible hasn't changed. The Word of God hasn't changed. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. When you pick up this Bible or you go down to the store and buy one and start reading it, you're reading the very Word of God. It says, God breathed. God the Holy Spirit directed in the writing of this book. This is God's book. And it has God's message for you. And you can read it over and over and over again, but you get something fresh and new every time you read it. The first question that the devil asked the first woman, Eve, in the Garden of Eden was this. Hath God said? The devil was trying to plant in man and woman a doubt about the Word of God. He's been doing it ever since. He doesn't give up. But this is the Word of God, and it doesn't change from generation to generation. And what was true a thousand years ago is true today in this book. Human nature has not changed. Jeremiah the prophet once said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is your heart that way? Mine has been that way. Deceitful, wicked, thinks thoughts that it shouldn't think because it also means the mind and the heart. The moral law has not changed. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Honor thy father and thy mother. There's a rebellion today against authority. Thou shalt not commit adultery, the moral problem. That law has not changed. Thou shalt not steal. Look at the robberies and the cheating in school and the problems we have. We didn't have much cheating in the school I went to many years ago. Do you know why? The principal had a special room. And he had a way of making people change when they came out. I have a wonderful son-in-law who's a psychologist. He might not agree with me. But I believe in doing it the way that school teacher did it. I'm not going to tell you what he did. I'll let you guess. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor, lying. 
How many lies are told today? We read about fraud every day in our papers and see it on television. It's everywhere. And man did that a thousand years ago and he's doing it today. But the way of salvation has not changed either. Neither is there salvation in another. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus came to this earth to die. To die on a cross. To shed his blood. Why? To make atonement for our sins. Do you know that man cannot make atonement for his own sins? The Bible tells us that atonement is what Christ did on the cross. And nobody else can atone for your sins but you, but the cross. The, one, the only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think of the wrath of God abiding on you right now because you haven't opened your heart to Christ. You can leave here tonight with all your past forgiven, with Christ showing you the future, willing to answer your prayers. What a wonderful life we could lead. Instead, we're lonely, we're tired, we're confused, we're mixed up, we're sinful, we do things we know that are wrong and we don't know why we do them and you don't seem to have the ability to change. But you can change tonight. How do you do it? First, you must repent of your sins. Well, what does the word repent mean? It means to acknowledge, to confess to God, say, oh God, I have sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of living if you'll help me. I can't do it myself. And then you must believe. That word believe has a lot more to it than just Believing with your head. And there are many of you that believe in God. You believe in Christ. But you haven't really trusted. You haven't put all your weight in Him. You're not putting your whole life in Him. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. And that word believe means put trust and total confidence in. Christ is Lord and Savior. And you're not sure you've done that. And then you must confess Christ openly, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, the scripture said. I want you to turn with me to Hebrews the 12th chapter. And here it says, And this word yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken out of the things that are made, that these things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we will receive a kingdom which cannot be moved. Let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. And this passage says that when the world is shaking and trembling like an earthquake and things are falling all around, there'll be certain things that will remain. And I want to talk about those things that will remain. We're living in a changing world. On a world scale, we're seeing gigantic geophysical and ecological calamities throughout the world. And then we look at our world and we see the changes that are taking place in Europe. We see the wars that are going on in former Yugoslavia. And there are many people that think that perhaps we're seeing the beginning of what could be another world war in that part of the world. There are changes in weather patterns an increasing number of tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, fires, natural disasters. What's happening reminds me of a bishop who made an amazing speech in a church 125 years ago. 
He was speaking at a conference. And the bishop said, the millennium is at hand. Man has invented everything that can be invented. He's done all that he can do. And the words were spoken by a man by the name of Wright. The presiding officer challenged the remark, suggesting that a great invention would come along in which man would be able to fly. And the bishop said, no, he'll never fly. God won't let him fly. That's made for the birds or angels. You know what his name? His name was Wright, and he had two sons by the name of Oliver and Wilbur. And they invented the airplane. And they flew it first in North Carolina <laughs> at Kitty Hawk. And it changed human history. And yet there are certain things that have not changed in all these changes that we see taking place. We see things that are changing and things that are not changing. And the big question yesterday is, in our lives among young people especially, is what is meaning? Fifty years ago, the philosophical question was, what's the truth? Today's question is, what is the point? Albert Camus said a quarter of a century ago, man cannot live without meaning. And before we came to the platform, we were sitting in there talking into another room, and we were talking about the purpose and meaning of life for young people today. And so many young people are searching for purpose and meaning. Where did I come from? Why am I here? Where am I going? What is life all about? And the suicide rate throughout the country continues to increase among young people. They can't figure life out. T.S. Eliot once said, where is the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? The Bible says the Lord, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we hear a lot about the internet and the information highway. And we're seeing some things in it that disturb us. Because on the internet, they can put pornography. The information highway is carrying all kinds of things that we don't like, that could destroy our way of life someday in the future. It's a wonderful thing. All of these things, atomic power is wonderful. But man, for some reason, uses it for destruction. The word crisis is an overworked word. But this is a period of political change. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Those are the words of Jesus. That word distress means to be pressed from all sides. And I think we feel that way today, that we're pressed from all sides. And the more automation we have and the more science gives us, the less time we have. The more instruments we have to save time, the less time we have. And the word perplexed means no way out. This is a period of social change too. The greatest problems facing mankind today are social injustice, which is worldwide. It's not just limited to the United States. It's worldwide. It's within the human heart and the human heart has to be changed. That's the answer to our problem. That's the answer to our race problem, is the heart needs to be changed. But there's the poverty problems. My goodness, the people that in parts of the world that are refugees, that are starving, you see it on television and it breaks your heart. And if you love the Lord at all, it brings tears to your eyes to see the suffering that people are going through. And we need to do what we can. We can't do it all. It seems that the whole world expects America to do it all. We can't. We might as well tell them we can't. We can't solve all the problems. Only God can do that. <laughs> then we see nations of the world arming, many with atomic weapons, many with chemical weapons, biological weapons. They can turn loose some bugs and disease could sweep the planet. 
the uncertain economic problems with huge debts. Not only America is in debt, many countries of the world in debt and many families are in debt. How are we going to pay ourselves out of it? There's the drug and the alcohol use that we think is going to solve our problems. And then as a result of the wrong use of sex, we have AIDS. And there's no cure for AIDS. We're spending millions of dollars every year to try to find an answer and we haven't found it yet. Every little bit, somebody comes up and says, we think we've found something that's going to help, but it turns out to be a false alarm, a false hope. And then there's loneliness. People are lonely today. But some things never change. The laws of nature don't change. There are certain truths that never change. God hasn't changed. The Bible says, I am the Lord, I change not. The Bible says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change. God hasn't changed in all of these centuries. The Bible says that God had no beginning. He has no end. I don't understand that. Who made God? Where did God come from? I don't know. He's always been. He's always existed. He's the same in every generation and he doesn't change in the slightest. It says there's no variableness, neither shadow of turning with God in James. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And the scripture says in Revelation 4, Holy, holy Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. Three times he said, Holy, that stands for the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God does not change. And He hasn't changed in all the centuries. And God is unchanging in judgment. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, the Bible says. He's going to judge every one of us. There's going to be a great judgment day in which we will stand before God. And we will have to give an account of the life we've lived and the things we've done and all the secret things that we've done will all be pulled out in front of the whole universe to see. And God is a holy God who is going to judge. But God is also unchanging in His love. God commended His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves you. And when we finish this crusade, I hope there'll be one thing that stands out in your mind, that God loves you, and God loves you, and God loves me. The Bible hasn't changed. The Word of God hasn't changed. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Word of our God shall stand forever. When you pick up this Bible or you go down to the store and buy one and start reading it, you're reading the very Word of God. It says, God breathed. God the Holy Spirit directed in the writing of this book. This is God's book. And it has God's message for you. And you can read it over and over and over again, but you get something fresh and new every time you read it. The first question that the devil asked the first woman, Eve, in the Garden of Eden was this. Hath God said? The devil was trying to plant in man and woman a doubt about the Word of God. He's been doing it ever since. He doesn't give up. But this is the Word of God, and it doesn't change from generation to generation. And what was true a thousand years ago is true today in this book. Human nature has not changed. Jeremiah the prophet once said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Is your heart that way? Mine has been that way. Deceitful. Wicked. Thinks thoughts that it shouldn't think. Because it also means the mind and the heart. 
the moral law has not changed. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Honor thy father and thy mother. There's a rebellion today against authority. Thou shalt not commit adultery, the moral problem. That law has not changed. Thou shalt not steal. Look at the robberies and the cheating in school and the problems we have. We didn't have much cheating in the school I went to many years ago. Do you know why? The principal had a special room. And he had a way of making people change when they came out. I have a wonderful son-in-law who's a psychologist. He might not agree with me, but I believe in doing it the way that school teacher did it. I'm not going to tell you what he did. I'll let you guess. Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor, lying. How many lies are told today? We read about fraud every day in our papers and see it on television. It's everywhere. And man did that a thousand years ago and he's doing it today. But the way of salvation has not changed either. Neither is there salvation in another. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we may be saved. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. Jesus came to this earth to die. To die on a cross. To shed his blood. Why? To make atonement for our sins. Do you know that man cannot make atonement for his own sins? The Bible tells us that atonement is what Christ did on the cross. And nobody else can atone for your sins but you, but the cross. The, one, the only one in history of whom it is written, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Think of the wrath of God abiding on you right now, because you haven't opened your heart to Christ. You can leave here tonight with all your past forgiven, with Christ showing you the future, willing to answer your prayers. What a wonderful life we could lead. Instead, we're lonely, we're tired, we're confused, we're mixed up, we're sinful. We do things we know that are wrong and we don't know why we do them. And you don't seem to have the ability to change. But you can change tonight. How do you do it? First, you must repent of your sins. Well, what does the word repent mean? It means to acknowledge, to confess to God, say, oh God, I have sinned. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm willing to change my way of living. If you'll help me, I can't do it myself. And then you must believe. That word believe has a lot more to it than just believing with your head. And there are many of you that believe in God. You believe in Christ. But you haven't really trusted. You haven't put all your weight in him. You're not putting your whole life in him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe. Now that word believe means put trust and total confidence in. Christ is Lord and Savior. And you're not sure you've done that. And then you must confess Christ openly that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved, the scripture said. Now I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Exodus the third chapter of Exodus. Now Moses had been called of God out of a burning bush, a bush that wouldn't burn. 
the fire was there, but not the bush. The bush was still there. And May, Moses went over to investigate. And God said, Moses, I want you to do something. I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh that he must let the people go. They've been held in slavery and bondage for nearly 400 years. You tell them, you tell Pharaoh that he has to let them go. And Moses was very disturbed about it and frightened and nervous. And he said, what if the people of Israel that are working down there as slaves won't have me as their leader? Who should I tell them I am and who you are? They don't even know who you are. And God replied and said to Moses, tell them that I am, that I am. I am sent you. That means from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. He is I am. There are many things about that that we don't understand. Where did God come from? Do you ever ask yourself that question? How did God get all this power that he could create all these galaxies out there? Where did God get all this tenderness and love that he would send his son to down a cross for us? We ask ourselves those questions. He said, I am. And in the New Testament, in the book of John, seven times, Jesus said, I am. And I want to talk to you about that tonight. Jesus told us who he was. The first thing he said, he said, I am the bread of life. Now the whole world searches for bread. Bread and rice, I found out in my tours of Asia, that rice is the staff of life to them as bread is to us. And Jesus said, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. Think of it, if you come to Christ, you will never hunger. What does he mean by that? Both bread and rice are the staff of life. And Jesus had a great compassion for the hungry. And we should too. We're taking up food here tonight and clothes for people that are hungry. I don't have enough clothes for the winter. And I hope you will have a part in this Love in Action program. And that's what we all should be doing all the time. Jesus said, I was a hungered and he gave me meat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you took me in naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you? or thirsty and gave you to drink. We don't remember that. But Jesus had a greater concern for the soul hunger. A prominent doctor said some time ago, more people die of loneliness, guilt, depression, tension, insecurity, and of heart hunger than die of physical starvation. And how true that is. Bread in the scriptures is often the symbol of spiritual life. Man has an inborn hunger for God. We're born with a hunger for God. We don't know that it's a hunger for God. And millions of people around the world are seeking something. That's the reason we have so many religions in the world. People are seeking something. They're not quite sure what. And they cannot be satisfied with anything less than God. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He can come into your life and touch every area of your life, including your married life, your sex life, your economic life, your love life, whatever it is. He can come in and he can give you total satisfaction if you let him. 
He said, I'm the living bread. I'm the living bread which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he will live forever. You say, well, how do you do that? It's so complicated. No, he said, the scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus' first sermon had to do with repentance. Change your way of living, change your mind and live for God. Then secondly, Jesus said, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12. With all of our scientific knowledge, we don't really have a precise definition of light. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I read it in a scientific magazine. While we do not know all about what light is, we do know many of its effects. We know that there could be no plant, animal, or human life on this planet without light. God put the sun in a precise balance and distance from this world. And we would all die were it not for that sunlight. And what the sun is to the earth, Jesus Christ is to the human heart. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The first thing that light does is reveal. It reveals when you can see in your heart, you'll find that you too have sinned against God. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And do you know something? Gather all the darkness in the whole world and it cannot put out the light of a single candle. Go into a closet and get yourself a big bag and try to capture all the darkness you can and carry it out and put it on that candle. It won't go out. The candle reveals what's in the darkness. Christ wants to turn on his light in your heart and he wants all of us to be reflectors of his light. I read about a man who went into his basement and found some potatoes had sprouted in the darkest corner of the room. At first he couldn't figure out what had happened until he heard that his wife had scrubbed a copper kettle and hung it from the ceiling near the window. And she kept the kettle so brightly polished that it reflected the rays of the sun on those potatoes and they sprouted. We should all be like that copper kettle, catching the rays of Jesus Christ and reflecting his light to someone in a dark corner. There's a woman in New York City and several times a year I go to New York and she sits on that same corner all the time during the winter. And I've passed her many times and I've stopped and talked to her and gotten to know her a little bit and I always give her some money. And several times lately she said, no, I don't want your money, Brother Graham. She said, they, they, they keep me up. I just want you to give me something of Jesus. And of course I talked to her about Christ and about the Lord. But we should all be reflecting the light of the Lord Jesus Christ in the way we live. God needs our light where the world is the darkest, the black of the night, the greater the need for a light bulb. If the bulb doesn't shine, it's not because of the darkness. Darkness can't put out any light. If the darkness increases until it is black as a cave, it is still not dark enough to extinguish a light. No one has yet smothered a light by increasing the darkness. Darkness gets darker because the light fails. When we fail to reflect Christ's light, we let the darkness win. And here, Jesus also said, thirdly, I am the door in John 10, 9. Now every house and every building has an entrance. This dome has several entrances. The kingdom of God has an entrance too. It's Jesus Christ. 
He said, I am the door. There's only one door in God's kingdom. And that door is Jesus. He, he knew a lot about doors because he was a carpenter and he had made a lot of doors. And while a building may have several entrances, the kingdom of God has only one. Have you come to that door? And when you come to that door, you must stoop and confess and acknowledge that you have failed morally and spiritually and that you have sinned against God. You've broken his commandments and you're sorry for it. And you're willing to change your way of life. Have you been through that door? Jesus stands there beckoning, calling you with his arms outstretched and he calls you from the cross. You see, he came not to be born as we celebrate at Christmas time. He came to die. That was his purpose in coming. He came to die for you and for me on that cross. And he didn't die just physically. Oh, they, it's one of the most horrible deaths that you can ever think about is the cross where you may hang there lingering for several days. The soldiers were gambling for his garment. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He had been rejected. But he stayed on that cross when they yelled for him to come down because if he had come down, the door would have been closed. There'd have been no way for any of us to ever get to heaven or to have our sins forgiven. He stayed on the cross for you. Then he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that mysterious moment that no theologian knows exactly what happened, he took our sins. God laid on him every sin that you have ever committed and every sin I've committed. All the thoughts and the intents of your life, the things you've done, the things that you've thought that are wrong. He took it on that cross. And because he did it, he can say, I forgive you. Your sins are gone forever. Are you certain that you're ready? You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, you must repent of sin. That means that you're willing to say to God, I am a sinner and I'm willing to change my way of living. You can't change your way of living, but God will help you to do it. He has to help you to repent. You don't have the strength to repent. And then the second thing is to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the scripture says. But that word believe means a great deal more than just believing with your head. When I walked on this platform the other night, I didn't check it out to see if it would hold a man. I knew that the carpenters had built it to hold a man. I believed and I put my full weight on this platform. You ought to put your full weight on Christ and say, I'm trusting him and him alone for my salvation. And then the third thing, you must be willing to obey him. Now I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of Exodus, the third chapter of Exodus. Now Moses had been called of God out of a burning bush, a bush that wouldn't burn. The fire was there, but not the bush, the bush was still there. And Moses went over to investigate and God said, Moses, I want you to do something. I want you to go back to Egypt and tell Pharaoh that he must let the people go. They've been held in slavery and bondage for nearly 400 years. You tell them, you tell Pharaoh that he has to let them go. And Moses was very disturbed about it and frightened and nervous. 
And he said, what if the people of Israel that are working down there as slaves won't have me as their leader? Who should I tell them I am and who you are? They don't even know who you are. And God replied and said to Moses, tell them that I am, that I am. I am sent you. That means from everlasting to everlasting, he is God. He is I am. There are many things about that that we don't understand. Where did God come from? Do you ever ask yourself that question? How did God get all this power that he could create all these galaxies out there? Where did God get all this tenderness and love that he would send his son to die on a cross for us? We ask ourselves those questions. He said, I am. And in the New Testament, in the book of John, seven times, Jesus said, I am. And I want to talk to you about that tonight. Jesus told us who he was. The first thing he said, he said, I am the bread of life. Now the whole world searches for bread. Bread and rice, I found out in my tours of Asia, that rice is the staff of life to them as bread is to us. And Jesus said, he that cometh to me shall never hunger. Think of it, if you come to Christ, you will never hunger. What does he mean by that? Both bread and rice are the staff of life. And Jesus had a great compassion for the hungry. And we should too. We're taking up food here tonight and clothes for people that are hungry. I don't have enough clothes for the winter. And I hope you will have a part in this Love in Action program. And that's what we all should be doing all the time. Jesus said, I was a hungered and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and fed you? or thirsty and gave you to drink. We don't remember that. But Jesus had a greater concern for the soul hunger. A prominent doctor said some time ago, more people die of loneliness, guilt, depression, tension, insecurity, and of heart hunger than die of physical starvation. And how true that is. Bread in the scriptures is often the symbol of spiritual life. Man has an inborn hunger for God. We're born with a hunger for God. We don't know that it's a hunger for God. And millions of people around the world are seeking something. That's the reason we have so many religions in the world. People are seeking something. They're not quite sure what. And they cannot be satisfied with anything less than God. And Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He can come into your life and touch every area of your life, including your married life, your sex life, your economic life, your love life, whatever it is. He can come in and he can give you total satisfaction if you let him. He said, I'm the living bread. I'm the living bread, which came down from heaven. And if any man eat of this bread, he will live forever. You say, well, how do you do that? It's so complicated. No, he said, the scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Jesus' first sermon had to do with repentance. Change your way of living, change your mind and live for God. Then secondly, Jesus said, I am the light of the world in John 8, 12. With all of our scientific knowledge, 
we don't really have a precise definition of light. Did you know that? I didn't know that until I read it in a scientific magazine. While we do not know all about what light is, we do know many of its effects. We know that there could be no plant, animal, or human life on this planet without light. God put the sun in a precise balance and distance from this world. And we would all die were it not for that sunlight. And what the sun is to the earth, Jesus Christ is to the human heart. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The first thing that light does is reveal. It reveals when you can see in your heart, you'll find that you too have sinned against God. Jesus said, I'm the light of the world. And do you know something? Gather all the darkness in the whole world and it cannot put out the light of a single candle. Go into a closet and get yourself a big bag and try to capture all the darkness you can and carry it out and put it on that candle. It won't go out. The candle reveals what's in the darkness. Christ wants to turn on his light in your heart and he wants all of us to be reflectors of his light. I read about a man who went into his basement and found some potatoes had sprouted in the darkest corner of the room. At first he couldn't figure out what had happened until he heard that his wife had scrubbed a copper kettle and hung it from the ceiling near the window. And she kept the kettle so brightly polished that it reflected the rays of the sun on those potatoes and they sprouted. We should all be like that copper kettle, catching the rays of Jesus Christ and reflecting his light to someone in a dark corner. There's a woman in New York City and several times a year I go to New York and she sits on that same corner all the time during the winter. And I've passed her many times and I've stopped and talked to her and gotten to know her a little bit and I always give her some money. And several times lately she said, no, I don't want your money, Brother Graham. She said, they, they, they keep me up. I just want you to give me something of Jesus. And of course I talked to her about Christ and about the Lord. But we should all be reflecting the light of the Lord Jesus Christ in the way we live. God needs our light where the world is the darkest, the blacker the night, the greater the need for a light bulb. If the bulb doesn't shine, it's not because of the darkness. Darkness can't put out any light. If the darkness increases until it is black as a cave, it is still not dark enough to extinguish a light. No one has yet smothered a light by increasing the darkness. Darkness gets darker because the light fails. When we fail to reflect Christ's light, we let the darkness win. And here, Jesus also said, thirdly, I am the door in John 10, 9. Now every house and every building has an entrance. This dome has several entrances. The kingdom of God has an entrance too. It's Jesus Christ. He said, I am the door. There's only one door in God's kingdom. And that door is Jesus. He, he knew a lot about doors because he was a carpenter and he had made a lot of doors. And while a building may have several entrances, the kingdom of God has only one. Have you come to that door? And when you come to that door, you must stoop and confess and acknowledge that you have failed morally and spiritually and that you have sinned against God. You've broken his commandments 
and you're sorry for it and you're willing to change your way of life. Have you been through that door? Jesus stands there beckoning, calling you with his arms outstretched and he calls you from the cross. You see, he came not to be born as we celebrate at Christmas time. He came to die. That was his purpose in coming. He came to die for you and for me on that cross. And he didn't die just physically. Oh, they, it's one of the most horrible deaths that you can ever think about is the cross where you may hang there lingering for several days. The soldiers were gambling for his garment. He came unto his own and his own received him not. He'd been rejected. But he stayed on that cross when they yelled for him to come down because if he had come down, the door would have been closed. There'd have been no way for any of us to ever get to heaven or to have our sins forgiven. He stayed on the cross for you. Then he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And in that mysterious moment that no theologian knows exactly what happened, he took our sins. God laid on him every sin that you have ever committed and every sin I've committed. All the thoughts and the intents of your life, the things you've done, the things that you've thought that are wrong. He took it on that cross. And because he did it, he can say, I forgive you. Your sins are gone forever. Are you certain that you're ready? You say, well, what do I have to do? Three things. First, you must repent of sin. That means that you're willing to say to God, I am a sinner and I'm willing to change my way of living. You can't change your way of living, but God will help you to do it. He has to help you to repent. You don't have the strength to repent. And then the second thing is to believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved, the scripture says. But that word believe means a great deal more than just believing with your head. When I walked on this platform the other night, I didn't check it out to see if it'd hold a man. I knew that the carpenters had built it to hold a man. I believed and I put my full weight on this platform. You ought to put your full weight on Christ and say, I'm trusting him and him alone for my salvation. From our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. Tonight, I want to talk on fools. And I want you to turn with me to the third chapter of 1 Corinthians, beginning with the 18th verse. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. For it is written, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. A couple years ago, Anthony Newley sang, What kind of a fool am I? to the top of the charts. And uh, I looked up in the dictionary to see what a fool is, or one of my associates did for me. And the Bible has a lot to say about fools and what a fool is. Proverbs 10, 21, it says, fools die for the want of wisdom. Proverbs 1, 7 says, fools despise wisdom. Uh, when P.T. Barnum came to this country many years ago, he said, the American people want to be fooled and I'm here to fool them. He said, a fool is born every minute. And uh, now synonyms that you can find for the word fool is stupid person, bonehead, blockhead, simpleton, chump, nitwit, goose, sap, numbskull, ignoramus, beetlehead, whatever you want. <laughs> a one who has been imposed on by others, a stooge, a gullible, or a dupe. Now in the Bible, it may mean all of this, but it also has a moral meaning in the Bible and is a very important word in the Bible. And the verses seem almost paradoxical. 1 Corinthians 3.18 says, Let him become a fool. And Proverbs 1.7 says, Fools despise wisdom. 
and God is speaking from the divine standpoint. In one passage, the fool is an unthinking, thoughtless, careless person without true understanding. In the other passage, the word fool is used from the standpoint of people who have received Christ because the world laughs at them and says they're foolish and ridiculous. They're fools. So there are unwise fools and there are wise fools. Now Jesus said, whoever calls his brother a fool is in danger of hellfire. You be very careful how you call another person a fool. I wouldn't dare use that name for you or for anybody else. Never use the word fool in anger, the Bible says. But I'm telling you what God says about it in certain instances. First, there's the atheistic fool. It's repeated twice in Psalm 53, 1 and Psalm 14, 1. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. But in Hebrew, it actually means there is no God for me. In other words, the, this fool deliberately says there is no God for me. He's not saying there's no God. He's saying there's no God for me. Then there's the practical atheist. You see, there are many people that are really not atheists, but they are practical atheists in the sense that they live like an atheist. You profess to believe in God, but you don't live like you believe in God. You live as though there is no God. You too, in a sense, are an atheist. And there are hundreds here tonight like that. You believe in God with your mind. You may go to church, but you live as though God does not exist as far as you are concerned. And so you are an atheist in a sense. And then secondly, the Bible talks about the mocking fool, the mocking fool. Fools make a mock of sin, Proverbs 14, 9. Here is God in all of his holiness. And the Bible tells us that we've sinned against him. We've broken his laws. And we're under the sentence of death. We're under the sentence of death. I saw a film tonight on television on one of the news programs telling how many men and women are on death row in the United States right now. Under the sentence of death. All of us here tonight are under the sentence of death. The wages of sin is death, and we have all sinned and broken the laws of God. And so we're all sentenced to die. We are to die physically. The graveyards are full of, full of people that are there because sin caused death. And then sin also causes spiritual death. Your soul is dead. Your spirit is dead. Physically, you're alive, but your soul that lives inside your body is dead toward God. So you're a walking dead person under the sentence of death. And the only way that you can have that sentence lifted is to come to Christ by repentance of sin and faith in Him as your Lord and your Savior. If you would like that sentence lifted, if you would like your sins wiped out as though they had never existed, if you would like to be justified in the sight of God, pick up that telephone right now you that are watching by television. Pick it up and call the number that you see on your screen and a counselor will answer. And the counselor will talk to you about how you can come to know Christ. As many people here tonight, I hope and believe and pray, will find Christ as their Lord and Savior. But there are many people that make a mockery of sins. They mock God's standards. God's standards of sex. God's standards of marriage. God's standards concerning divorce and ethics and morality and social justice. We make a mockery of it. We laugh at it. The Bible says, be sure your sins will find you out. Don't ever doubt it. Your sin, your sin will find you out, though no one on earth may discover it. You may never be caught. You may never have to pay for it here, as far as you can tell. But your sin will someday be found out. No one ever commits one sin that isn't found out. Everything that you did in the darkness, every evil thought that you ever had is going to be found out because it'll all be recorded. It's being recorded awaiting the judgment day. It's being recorded on tape machines far more sophisticated than anything we have. It's being recorded. Even your thoughts and your sins will find you out and it'll be exposed to the whole universe. Will find you out. Will. It's only a question of time. The word will is definite. Will find you out. 
find. Perhaps you've deceived everyone else, your wife, your family, your church, your friends, but the Bible says your sin will definitely find you out. A detective at last, after running away so long and hiding so long, God's hand will come on your shoulder and say, I have found you. You've been found out. We now know. And then thirdly, there's the slandering fool, the slandering fool. He that hideth hatred with lying lips, and he that uttereth a slander is a fool, passing along an evil story about others, maligning other people's character, wrecking their reputations by evil gossip. Gossiping is listed in the Bible as one of the worst of all sins. And yet how frequent that's done even in circles that call themselves Christians. It's a terrible sin in the sight of God, and God says that person is a fool. You wouldn't think of killing a person with a gun or a knife. But then many times we assassinate a character or try to pull someone down or to get even or because of jealousy by whispering innuendos. Someone told me, or he did thus and so. We commit murder by character assassination, worse than killing a man with a pistol, a knife, or a club. He that others a slander, the Scripture says, is a fool. And then fourthly, there's the Christian fool. The Christian fool. Remember the road to Emmaus after Jesus Christ had died on the cross for our sins and he'd been raised again? And remember, he was appearing to the disciples, in fact, 11 different appearances after his resurrection. And this is one of them. And these two disciples were on the way to Emmaus outside of Jerusalem. They were sad. They were disappointed. They were disillusioned. And they were mumbling and groaning among themselves. And another man joined them. And they didn't recognize who he was. And he talked to them, said, why are you so downcast? They said, oh, we thought he was to be the Messiah. Haven't you heard all the happenings in Jerusalem during the past week about this Jesus who did wonderful things? We thought he was the Messiah. We thought he'd come to save the world, but he didn't. He disappointed us. They killed him on a cross, and now the third day has passed, and we heard rumors that he might be raised from the dead, but we don't accept that. And then Jesus said, oh, fools, you're fools. Then he started expounding to them the scriptures from Moses through the prophets as to who he really was. And then he went to spend the evening with them, and he was sitting at the meal in their home in Emmaus. And all of a sudden, their eyes were open, and they saw it was Jesus. In other words, the Christian fool who has the Word of God in his hand who reads his testimony and yet doubts the promises of God. Jesus said, oh, you fools, for not believing the Scriptures, that he was going to rise from the dead and someday he's coming back. And then, fifthly, there's the covetous fool. And the story is told in Luke, the 12th chapter. Jesus told the story about a rich man in his barns. You remember he built his barns and he said he was going to retire because he'd made enough money now, probably going to go to Southern California, Florida, come here to Idaho to this beautiful place and retire. He'd made enough money. And he said, soul, take thy knees, drink and be merry. And that night he had a heart attack. And when he was dying, there was a voice heard from heaven that said, thou fool this night. Thy soul is required of thee. And the scripture says, Jesus said, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You see, he tried to find happiness in the wrong place. Money. He ignored the power of influence in that no man liveth unto himself. He must have had a family. He disregarded death. He had made no provision for eternity. He had provision for his retirement. How many men and women I know who have planned for retirement, planned everything, but they haven't prepared to die, and they die shortly after they retire? It's amazing. I've thought about that. 
Some people announce their retirement. You read two or three weeks later that they dropped dead of a heart attack. They thought they were going to have five or 10 or 15 or 20 years that they could just take it easy and enjoy life. But it doesn't always work out that way. You better be sure that you have prepared to meet God. Every person who is more concerned about getting some of this world's goods and leaving out the preparation for eternity is a fool. Or the person who spends their time in social climbing or having pleasure more than eternal things is a fool in the sight of God. If you're not concerned about your home in heaven, you're not concerned about the riches that will never fail, not concerned about laying up treasure where moth and rust doth not corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal, then you're a fool. If you'd ask this man, what is your name? Well, he'd say, my name's the rich man. Or, I'm the prosperous man that you read about. Or, I'm an eminent man. I'm a great man in the neighborhood. Or, I'm a famous man. My name is in the paper all the time. Then ask God, Lord, what is this man's name? And the answer comes back, fool. He's a fool. That's his name. The rich man knew every name but the right one. He had been called by his family name, his given name, his ranks, his titles, his wealth, the flatteries of men. But in the sight of God, his name was Thou Fool. That's all we know about him, that he was just a rich fool. That laid up treasures on earth, but laid up nothing for heaven. And how many of us are in the same category? You may not be rich, in the sense that this man was rich, but everybody in America is rich compared to Bangladesh and people that I've, where we've been in many places of the world, like in Africa, or as Victor was talking about in, in Vietnam, where he was a missionary for some years. Very few of you would stir if I would look out on this audience and say, fool, come here, I'd like to see you. How many of you would get up and come? <laughs> Very few, maybe nobody. But the Bible says, how are they brought into desolation as in a moment? Quickly, it can all end. Your dream house comes tumbling down. Trouble in the family. The wealth is gone. Here was a man, a multimillionaire perhaps, but standing a hand's breadth away from his own grave counting on everything in this life, the happiness, the joy that this life could give him, and he's called in the Bible by Jesus a fool. And then seventhly, there's another kind of a fool, or sixthly, the preaching of the cross is foolishness to them that perish. 1 Corinthians 1.18, but unto us which were saved it is the power of God. What the world counts foolish, we have rested our eternal salvation on. And when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, turn your back on the pleasures and the sensual lust and things of this world, people think you're a fool. The world that does not know Christ looks foolish to me. Why can't they see? Why can't they understand? I want to grab everybody I see on the street and everybody we pass, everybody in the hotel, I want to grab them and say, look here. Christ could change your life. I see their empty faces and I, I see the ho hear the hollow laughter. And I see them drinking, trying to drink their, themselves into some happiness or taking the drugs and that hollow stare that they have. And I say, oh, if I could only just shake them loose. But you see, only the Holy Spirit can do that. I cannot do the work of the Holy Spirit for him. The Holy Spirit must convict them of sin. He must also lift this veil that's over their minds. And so salvation is of the Lord, the Bible says. If anyone desires wisdom, let him take his place in identification with Jesus Christ. What the world calls foolish, I'm resting my salvation on the cross of Christ, no matter what the world may think of him or of me. We're fools for Christ's sake, willing for the world to look at us as out of our minds, willing to be accounted as the very offscoring of the earth because we've turned to Christ. Are you one of the devil's fools? 
Are you willing to be a fool for Christ's sake? The Bible says in Proverbs 12, the way of a fool is right in his own eye. There is a way that seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which road are you on? The narrow road that leads to eternal life or the broad road that leads to destruction? You have to make a choice. The Scripture says, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Are you going to continue to be a fool in the sight of God? Or are you going to become another kind of fool the Christ fool that the world will call a fool and call foolishness. Because you see, when you come to Christ, there's a price to pay. And one of the prices you pay is being misunderstood by some members of your family, some people in the community, some people where you work or where you go to school. And that's what Jesus meant when he said, come and take up the cross and follow me. You see, the cross that you bear, the cross that you bear is identification with Christ. It's not some special sickness that you get or some trouble you get. It's identifying with Christ and letting people laugh at you and being willing for them to make sport of you if necessary for following Christ. That's your cross. And if you're not willing to take that cross, you cannot be his follower, he said. Are you willing to take that cross? Are you willing to turn your life totally over to Christ? Some of us have got one foot in heaven and one foot in hell, as it were. One foot in the world, one foot in the kingdom of God. And we're straddling the fence. God does not allow fence straddlers. You cannot be a mugwomp. That's what a mugwomp is, a fence straddler. God, Christ does not allow that. He allows no neutrality. You can't not be both. You must come all out. For him, and you'll find that all the way through the Bible. You'll find it all the way through the teachings of Jesus. A great crowd was following Jesus one day, and he turned and talked to them about the fact that he was going to die on the cross, and it said, Many followed him no more. Why? Because they couldn't take this talk of the cross. Do you want Christ in your heart? Pick up that telephone right now if you're watching by television. Talk to that counselor. Make that call. And if, you, if it's a busy signal, call again. They'll be there all evening, all over the country. And you can talk to somebody and receive Christ into your heart tonight. Because you see, when Christ died on the cross, it says that the crowd down below, the mob below, ridiculed and laughed. And they said, what a fool. You saved others, but you cannot save yourself. <laughs> and Jesus was hanging there. And in heaven, 72,000 angels, 10 legions drew their swords, ready to come and rescue him. But he said, no, I love them. And when he died on the cross, he took your sins. Every sin that you've ever committed, he took on that cross. He took your death penalty for you. And because he was the son of God, and because he was sinless, he could bear your sins. And God has accepted his death as a sin offering for our sins. So that when God looks at me now, he doesn't see Billy Graham the sinner. I am a sinner. I have sinned, but I've placed my sins under the blood of Christ. And the blood that was shed on the cross washes my sins away symbolically in the sight of God so that when God looks at me, he cannot see my sins. And God has a unique ability that you don't have. God can forget. And it says that he forgets your sins. In other words, the tapes are erased from the time you were born till the time you die. Because if one sin ever remained on those tapes, you'd never make it to heaven. God is righteous and holy. And before you can get into heaven, you must be righteous too. And the only way you can get any righteousness is to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And he offers you that righteous clothing tonight free. You don't have to pay for it. But you have to do three things. You must repent of your sins. That means you're willing to change your way of life. 
You're willing to change completely and put Christ first in your life from this moment on? You may be a member of the church. You may be a Catholic, a Mormon, Jewish, Protestant, whatever you are. You need Christ, and you want to make that commitment. I'm not asking you to join a church tonight, a specific church. I'm asking you to make sure that your sins are forgiven and that you're ready for heaven. First, repent. Second, receive him by faith into your heart. Faith means trust, total commitment. It means that he becomes the pilot of your plane or he becomes the driver of your car, of your life. You turn all the decision-making over to him. And that's a wonderful thing. You trust him for your salvation. And then the third thing, you're willing to obey him. Study the scriptures and pray and obey him and do what he says and be his follower no matter what the cost. I'm going to ask you to make that commitment tonight. I'm going to ask you to do what we've seen hundreds of people at each service do so far. I'm going to ask you to get up out of your seat and come and stand in front of the platform and say by coming, I want to make that commitment. I want to know my sins are forgiven. I want to know the sentence of death has been lifted. I want to know I'm going to heaven. Why do I ask you to come forward publicly? Because Jesus said, if you're not willing to acknowledge me before men, I'll not acknowledge you before my Father, which is in heaven. Jesus said, now is the, or the scripture says, now is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise that there'll ever be a tomorrow for you. It's tonight. I believe there are hundreds of people here tonight that may never have this moment again in your whole life in which you're so close to the kingdom of God. Just get up and come. Fathers, mothers, young people, hundreds of you. You want Christ in your heart tonight. You want to make that commitment. You get up and come quickly. And as people are coming forward here at the Coliseum, you make that telephone call right now. The number is on your screen and counselors are standing by ready to help you. As hundreds are responding to Mr. Graham's invitation to make a public commitment to Jesus Christ, you can make that same commitment right where you are. Just pick up the phone and call the number you see on your screen. Special friends are waiting to talk with you and pray with you about this most important decision. You that are watching by television can see that here in Boise, Idaho, many people are coming to make this commitment to Christ tonight. You can make that commitment right now where you are. You may be in a bar room. You may be in a nightclub. You may be in a hotel room. You may be in your living room or in your bedroom. Just say yes to Christ and let him come into your heart. As you can see, men and women and boys and girls from all over the Colosseum have come forward tonight to commit their heart and life to Jesus Christ. This is also a time of decision for many of you. Until then, this is Cliff Barrow speaking for Billy Graham and every member of the team saying goodbye and may God richly bless you. If you just prayed that prayer with my father or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers.
tales, hearts kept listening. Every flash illuminate her face. Crackling logs, boots still glistening. In this cabin, time moves at its own pace. Never fear darkness, never felt lonely. Storms just music with its own story. Thunders calling, winds a howling. Rain taps a rhythm on the tin. Candles flicker, shadows linger. Warmth inside where tales begin. Never fear darkness, never felt lonely. Storms just music with its own story. Old oaks creaking, branches speaking, whispers ancient through the storm. Fires crackling as hearts are slacking 